Oh no, what if I go to the doctor and I find this out? Or, oh no, what if I go to work and -and so-and-so happens to be at work today? What am I going to do? Oh boy, the test is coming up today. What if I don't get the A that I really, really want? Oh no. You know, we worry about things all the time. How many of you are worried about something right now? Something that hasn't happened yet. I read a statistic, and I know that you take statistics with a grain of salt, but I read that 93% of the things we worry about never happen. And if you put all the things you're worried about, write them down on a Wednesday and put them in a worry box, and if you come back the following Wednesday, a lot of those things in the worry box you can throw out because they never happen. Uh, That's just what I read. That's just what I researched. That's what I recognize and understand. We do it all the time. And even if something that we worry about does happen, does that mean all of a sudden God fell off the throne and go, oh my goodness, I had no idea that was going to happen. Maybe I should worry. (laughs) No, God is still sovereign. God is still in control. And so what worry really is, is a lack of faith in the sovereignty and authority and providence of Almighty God. You know, that's why Jesus says in Matthew 6, 25, do not worry about your life, about your body, what you will eat or what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? And here in Genesis chapter 33, Jacob has been worrying himself into a frenzy over what his brother Esau is going to do when he sees him. And he's thinking the worst. Esau's coming to me with 400 men. Well, he wrestles with God in prayer all night long. That's one very good thing that comes out of it, is that he turns to God. And that's what our worry should do, is get us to turn to God and give them over to God. Genesis 33. Jacob looked up. And there was Esau coming with his 400 men. So he's probably freaked a little bit. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maidservants. He put the maidservants and their children in front, Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph in the rear. So he put his favorite wife and his favorite kid in the safest spot in the group. He himself went on ahead and bowed down to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. And a bowing down seven times in the ancient Near East was a sign of complete and absolute submission. But verse 4, Esau, but Esau, ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. All of the fears and the fretting and the frantic stuff and the worrying, it was all for naught. God had worked in Esau's heart over the last 20 years and had softened his heart. And I think God had softened Esau's heart by providing for him and blessing him. Remember, he asked his father, do you not have you have more than one blessing? Bless me too, my father. And so both were blessed. I mean, Jacob got the blessing of being the family line that leads straight to the Messiah. But Esau was blessed also. Verse 5, the brothers are hugging and weeping. And this is a prefiguration of what's going to happen during the millennium when Edom is restored to God. And Edom and Israel and Egypt and Assyria will be worshiping God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 5, then Esau looked up and saw the women and children. Who are these with you? Jacob answered, they are the children God has graciously given your servant. So Jacob continues to um, defer to the authority of his brother. Verse 6, then the maidservants and their children approached and bowed down. Next, Leah and her children came and bowed down. Last of all came Joseph and Rachel, and they too bowed down. And you imagine the conversation among the women. You know, this is the first time I've ever seen Jacob's brother. You know, they don't really look alike at all. (laughs) 
you know, Esau is so red. Where did he get the red from? Jacob doesn't have any red in him at all. And they, yeah, they're brothers, but they seem so different. And just imagine the conversation of them seeing their brother-in-law or uncle for the very first time. Verse 8, Esau said, what do you mean by all these droves that I met? To find favor in your eyes, my lord, he said. And so in the ancient Near East, you don't accept a gift from anybody unless you're willing to accept their gift of friendship. And that's what Jacob is all about. He wants to accept Esau's forgiveness by offering all of these droves to Esau. He's extending forgiveness. And Esau will extend forgiveness to Jacob by taking these gifts. You know, sometimes you don't have to say anything. You know, Jacob never says, I'm sorry for being a putz the last 20 some years or 30 years. He And Esau never said, I accept your apology for being a putz for the last 20 or 30 years. You know, sometimes God just does a good work in your heart and you can show grace to each other without digging up every little detail of the past. You know, I used to think you had to do that in order to make peace with somebody you had differences with in the past. You always had to go back there with them and dredge up the details and apologize for each one. I don't think it's necessary always to do that. Just a general expression of regret for how things went in the past. And is it okay if we have peace going forward? And then verse 9, Esau said, I already have plenty, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. No, please, Jacob said. If I found favor in your eyes, accept this gift from me. For to see your face is like seeing the face of God now that I know you've received me favorably. And because Jacob kept insisting and pleading, Esau accepted. That was his way of accepting and extending forgiveness. And then verse 12, Esau said, let us be on our way. I'll accompany you. We're in the land. Uh, you know, we're across the Jabbok River. Follow me to the south to where I live in Seir. And Jacob is like, I don't want to go to Seir. My Lord knows that the children are tender and I must care for the ewes and the cows that are nursing their young. If they're driven hard just one day, all the animals will die. Is that really true? Because when he escaped from Laban, man, he was boogatating it out of there. He was, in three days, he went like, what, 160 miles? Or no, it was further than that. It was more like 250, 260 miles west, all the way to the land of Gilead. He drove them hard for three days and they didn't die. So already we're seeing a little bit of the old Jacob coming out. Oh man, I've got to, you know, lie and spread the, you know, kind of stretch the truth a little bit so I can get out of the situation where I might have to go to where my brother lives and live with my brother all the time. You know, I know you guys love your brothers and sisters, but now that you're adults, do you want to live with your brothers and sisters all the time? Maybe, maybe not. And Jacob's like, I don't want to, I ain't going to do that. So Jacob is like, let my Lord go on ahead of his servants Go ahead two or three days while I move along slowly at the pace of the droves before me and that of the children until I come to my Lord and say year. Hey, June, how you doing? It is a beautiful day outside, sunny and 40 degrees. That's like shorts weather here in Northeast Wisconsin. Amen. <laughs> and, you know, Jacob has no intention of going to Esau's hometown. That'd be like the Packers saying, I can't wait till we go to Chicago and hang out in Chicago all the time. Or I can't wait to hang out at, in, in Minnesota and hang out with the Vikings. You no, know, no, he's just saying. Esau said, well, let me leave some of my men with you. <laughs> Jacob's like, no, 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 no. Why would you want to do that? Just let me find favor in your eyes. So verse 16, that day Esau started on his way back to Seir. Jacob, however, he went to Sukkoth, where he built a place for himself and made shelters for his livestock. You know, Jacob was probably right that he belonged in the promised land. But here's the thing. God had appeared to him in a dream about meeting him in Bethel. He was supposed to go to Bethel, where he first went when he was fleeing his brother Esau on the way up to the land of the Arameans. But he didn't go where Esau wanted him to go. 
and he tricked Esau into thinking he would. And now he doesn't want to go where God wants him to go. He wants to go. He still wants to go where he wants to go. And he goes to Sukkoth where he built a place for himself and made shelters for his livestock. That is why the place is called Sukkoth. And Sukkoth in he in Hebrew means a place of tabernacling or a place of shelter. Verse eighteen. After Jacob came from Padan Aram, he arrived safely at the city of Shechem in Canaan and camped within sight of the city. We're going to see in a little while that that is going to be a mistake. That that that's going to cause a lot of problems on Monday when we get back together for Genesis chapter thirty four. You know, it's always best to go where God wants you to go and do what God wants you to do, even if you don't feel like it at that particular moment. It says in verse 19, for a hundred pieces of silver, he bought from the sons of Hammer, the father of Shechem, the plot of ground where he pitched his tent. There he set up an altar and called it El Elohe Israel, which means mighty is or strong is the god of israel but you know what what does first samuel 15 verse 22 say to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed is better than the fat of rams yeah it's great that jacob built an altar to the lord like isaac built an altar to the lord and abraham built altars to the lord but it's even better to obey the lord what good is it to put up fronts of worship and praise when you're not doing what god wants you to do in your life obedience is the best way to go and then you offer sacrifices of praise and worship out of gratitude and love for the god you are already obeying well, anyways jacob is still a work in progress and tomorrow we'll find out the bad or monday we'll find out what happens because jacob went to near the land of Shechem in Canaan instead of going to Bethel, the house of God. Jesus loves you. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. You guys have a wonderful weekend. Tomorrow, I'm looking forward to hanging out with one of the families in the church, and the kids play video games, so I'm going to be playing video games. I'm so excited about that. And then we got church on Sunday. We're going to be looking at Proverbs 14, verse 30, and we're going to talk about overcoming envy, or an envious, covetous spirit. You guys have a great weekend. Enjoy the sunshine, and God bless.